All right, so we're going to close uh, with another uh, talk more on the infrastructure side of th things. Emil, thanks for being here. Thanks. Excited to have you. Sure. Cool. Uh, so I thought I'd kick it off with uh, a couple of questions to get to know the audience a little bit. Um, please raise your hand if, you, if you're a developer or a data scientist, uh, if you write code every day. Raise your hand. All right, about one third, maybe? OK, raise your hand if you're not. Another third. All right. Back to first principle. Venn diagrams, you people? Like, if you're not, then, OK. All right, so one third is a developer today, one third isn't, and another third is uh, not confused, I guess, or something like that. Yeah, it's learning, learning Venn diagrams and, and logic. Um, cool, <laughs> excellent. So um, my name is Emil Afram, uh, and I am the CEO and, and founder of an open source project called Neo4j, N-E-O4j. And I'm also uh, the CEO of its commercial sponsor, a company called Neo Technology. Um, I really only have one ground rule for all of my talks that I want you guys to adhere to very strictly, uh, which is I do not want your undivided attention. Right? We're actually online. The Wi-Fi works here. Uh, so do tweet about this. Uh, let me know if I'm doing good or bad. Uh, the only thing that I do ask of you is that you use the Neo4j hashtag, because I monitor that one religiously. And, and data driven NYC as a hashtag. As and that, and that what, what he said. <laughs> cool. Um, we're going to spend some time in the graph world today. Uh, but before we do, uh, I want to kick that off by asking the audience a question. And so I'm going to give you a second chance here. Don't screw this up, this one, uh, one more time, right? So the question is, I have six logos on the screen here. What do these six logos have in common? Well, the companies, what do they have in common? You can just shout it out. They're all tech companies. Tech companies? Good one. What's that? Blue. Love it. Love it. Actually, the second time I saw it, that is bonus extra credential for, for pattern matching. The color blue, blue in their logo. Uh, they don't have storage, no real estate, no nothing. They don't have storage, no real estate? Ah, cool, interesting. They use Neo4j? They use Neo4j, great answer. <laughs> Actually, not true. We do work with, uh, with uh, quite, a, quite a few of these companies, but n all of them don't use Neo4j. The question, though, is related to, to what you said. And every one of these companies are, uh, uh, is a leader in their market. And they all became a leader and ended up dominating their category by doing exactly one thing, which is they shifted in perspective and looked at their data in a different way. Right? In particular, they said that, hey, data is kind of nice in isolation, in silos, but in every single data set out there that is interesting, there's actually hidden or explicit connections. What if we take those connections and we start leveraging them and use them for more insight to gain business value, what is going to happen? And that was the key moment that turned every one of these companies into a winner in their category. Leveraging connected data. One example of this is these companies over here, right? Excite, Alta Vista, Lycus, we all remember them from the, from the late 90s. Uh, I grew up as a professional programmer in the, in the mid 90s, ended up being super fascinated when I heard about what these companies were doing, right? So out there we have this data structure, the web, which like is doubling every week or something insane like that, right, at the time. Um, and what we're going to do, said Lycus and Excite and Alta Vista and all, all these companies, um, is that we're going to download the entire web, like all of it, into our data center. And then when someone searches for uh, New York, or whatever, we're going to go inside each and every one of these documents and we're going to look and see if there's the phrase New York and we're going to serve that back up to the user. Of course, it's going to be indexed, etc. but conceptually, we're looking inside each and every one of these. And oh, by the way, we're going to download this, this entire super huge data structure every freaking day, right? I just thought that was astounding, an astounding, astounding ambition and accomplishment, right? Very cool technology. 
But then along came a tiny little startup which said, we're going to do exactly that. But not only that, we're also going to look inside of these documents and we're going to identify the ahref uh, links in there, which of course is an HTML link. And we're going to take that data, take those connections, and we're going to put them in a system that allows us to work with those connections as first class citizens. And we're going to rank the search result according to that, right? And that one innovation, that tiny little thing that these guys did, the conceptual thing, but also building that, that entire technology stack that allowed it to do that, created Google, right? Uh, the most significant, in my mind, the most significant company of at least the previous decade was that one innovation. They looked at the connections as well as the data in and of themselves. Another example, monster.com. They do exactly what we've always done when we're looking for a job. We take a profile description and we take the CV and we try to match them. Right? Eh. That's not at all how we've always done it when we look for a job. What we usually do as human beings is that we go through our network, our graph, right? We ask our friends and they ask their friends, etc. There's a tiny little startup led by Reid Hoffman who said, hey, what if I don't just store the profiles, but I actually store the connections between them, the professional networks, right? And leverage them. That's going to allow me to build a much more successful company, right? And that's why LinkedIn is worth, I don't know, a gazillion more times than, than Monster.com. Third example, late 90s, a bunch of people tried to do online payment. Turns out to be a really hard problem. Why? The key challenge is fraud detection, right? And if your entire worldview is singular transactions, transmitter, receiver, dollar amount, then it becomes really hard to do fraud detection. But then again, we've heard the story before, a small startup came along and said, what if we had not just individual transactions, but a group of transactions, in fact, a network of transactions, um, and that is going to allow us to detect fraud much more powerfully. And that's exactly what they did. So PayPal pulled, pulled that off, and that's why they became very successful in the online payments area. Right? So three examples of companies in the consumer web that have taken this shift in perspective and start using connections in their data. And very frequently, the connections already existed in their data. Some, some examples, uh, that's not true. For example, with LinkedIn, they had to in, um, incentivize the user to volunteer those connections. But in other examples, like in Google, the, the connections already existed there. It's just that their technologies and their mindsets were shaped along not using connections. Right? So that's in the consumer web. Uh, and my argument is that this is now happening across all verticals. We have this sort of tongue-in-cheek saying at Neo4j, graphs are eating the world, modeled after how software is eating the world, you know, what Mark Andreessen is saying, um, where vertical after vertical is starting to adopt technologies that allow them to leverage connected data. Right? One example of this is logistics. So one of the biggest uh, um, logistics company on the planet, uh, huge, huge, uh, half a million employees, etc owns a bunch of big brands that you, you guys know of. Um, and they do all of the parcel routing, the package routing. So when I say package routing, you think TCP IP, but we're talking actual physical packages. Right? Um, for a major country in Europe, they ran into a problem back in 2011. They saw that by Christmas of 2012, so Christmas a year later, they would not be able to deliver packages. Right? And of course, it's a highly seasonal business. And their problem was not um, uh, the, the physical infrastructure of that country, they have a very, uh, very efficient physical infrastructure in this major company in Europe. Um, uh, the problem was not that. So for example, if you want to send something from point A to point B over here, you can see there's a very efficient road here. You can go just across it from point A to point B, right? But the software that we, they were using forced them to send everything through central routing tables, so central routing centers. So you had to send everything from A up to the core routing center and then back down to B, right? What they had to do, what they were forced to do, once they started double-clicking on that, they saw that the problem with that was their software, right? And the problem with the software was the database. The database only allowed them to express very few or very low number of connections in, in, in their data set. So what they did is that they implemented Neo4j throughout their entire 20, 30-year-old old software. We rewrote it from scratch, um, implemented Neo4j, which allowed them then inside of their data set to express all the fine granular connections that existed in the real world. And now they can send package A to so package from, from point A to point B in time 
for Christmas. So we saved Christmas for a major country in Europe in 2012. Right? One example. Another example is retail. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. Walmart is, uh, is publicly using us to do real-time recommendations where you look at the connections between all the customers and the product that, that they've used and match that to similar uh, similar people and then do that in real time based on purchase history but also based on clicks etc real-time recommendations very connections based um, and all about graphs second example internet of things uh, which more aptly should be called the internet of connected things if you don't have any connections with your internet of things there's no internet right so the internet of connected things and ends up being a lot of connected data which is absolutely amazingly well handled inside of a graph database another vertical that is currently being eaten completely by graphs so that's cool um, we at Neo4j got started with this a long time ago. We built the first prototype back in, 2000, two, back in 2000 with a zero at the end. So we've been at this for a while. We open sourced it in 2007. We got our first round of funding in 2009. We focused on the open source community in building out the product. In 2011 is when I moved here, well, moved to California. Um, and when we started focusing on the commercial side and actually getting this out to the broader market. And when we were raising money for our A round, we presented this slide saying, okay, we don't have any paying customers right now, but we have a lot of community users. And we sort of, we, and we, if you squint a little bit, you can see where the trend is pushing everything. And we think that these are the key early adopters for graph databases. Three verticals, software, financial services, and telecom. And then four use cases. Um, could double click on all of these, but I'm not, I don't have the time today. Uh, but network and data center management, lots of connections. Master data management, social, which is the one use case where people intuitively go to graph databases because of social graph, graph database. Um, and then geo, so getting from point A to point B. Right. Now we have the scorecard. This was a hypothesis back in 2011. These are people who are right now uh, um, relying, their business is relying on Neo4j, so they're up and running in production. You can see some small uh, hyped startups, but a lot of big brands today. This 4x3 matrix is a significant uh, part of the database market, if you look at it. Uh, so we're very proud of this. What's been even more amazing, though, is the traction that we have seen outside of these verticals over these past few years, when just vertical after vertical have started adopting graph databases. And one company starts to use it, builds better product because they have much more insight, a much more finely granular view of the world. Their products become better, which forces other companies in that vertical start using them in order to build better products, right? Graphs are eating the world. Um, we're not the only people saying this. Uh, there's a site called DB Engines, which measures popularity of databases now that there's 4 billion database projects out there, right? Um, and graph databases, whilst being one of the smaller cousins of the former NoSQL uh, phenomena, right, uh, has actually been the fastest growing category inside of all of big data, all of databases, uh, for the vast majority of the past two years. So pretty amazing. Um, uh, Bob quoted Gartner before. Gartner has a couple of interesting things that they, they say about graph databases. I love this quote. Graph analysis is possibly the single most effective competitive differentiator for companies out there, other outside of data capture, so outside of, of actually getting data uh, in the first place. Graph analysis is quite possibly the single most effective competitive differentiator. <laughs> Forrester is saying that over 25% of enterprises will be using graph databases in production by 2017. It's pretty amazing. So if you have not looked at graph databases yet, a uh, chance is that one of your competitor will. And then after that point, they will likely be able to build a better product. And so it's probably a good idea to start looking at them right now. I'm not the only person saying this. I picked out a local boy, John Ressing, um, who's the founder of um, jQuery. And saying nice things, this is one of the founders of Heroku, talking about uh, our query language, which I will demo in a little bit if I have time. Um, but what is a graph database? This is all fine and dandy, but what is it? What does it do? Right? For, the, for the third of you who writes code every day, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you a little bit more detail about what a graph database actually is. Right? So let's say that we want to model a very simple model. Right? We want to represent that in a graph. So we have a woman who loves a man, right? but not just any woman. We have specifically Anne, who specifically loves Dan. Right? As graph people, if you want to represent this, we like to take things and we call them nodes. 
right? And so we draw circles around them. And then relationships, we like to describe using arrows. So Anne loves Dan, same thing, right? This is awesome if you have a whiteboard, right? A little bit harder to express if you uh, are slacking or if you're Skyping or whatever, if you're expressing something in text, right? But one way of expressing something like this in text is by using, wait for it, ASCII art. Hands raised if you, if you remember ASCII art. The same one third people? No? <laughs> right, so with ASCII art, if you want to express this, you can see how and here you use parentheses to describe a node, and then you draw a relationship using minus, minus, and an arrow. So we've described the same thing using ASCII art. And then we can add data to it as well. We can say that Anne is a person, which is a label. So all, all nodes can have zero too many labels. Um, and then add properties in normal sort of JSON-ish type syntax, right? So Anne loves Dan. You can see that a pattern is emerging here, right? Uh, it's node with relationship to node, right? And what we've done here, very, very simply, is that we've been graphing, right? So if you take a bunch of these node relationship node, node relationship node, and you chain them together, you build up a network, which in mathematics is called a graph, right? So very simple. There's a way that you can query this using exactly the same syntax. We have a query language that we call Cypher. Um, and basically, you take something like this where you replace uh, the data for Dan with a variable, whom, right? You slap a match in front of it. You say return whom. You throw that to Neo4j and it's gonna look inside its entire big graph potentially, right? And it's gonna find instances of this pattern and return that to you. So I'm gonna do a really quick demo of this just so that you have get a flavor of what it, what it looks like. Um, hopefully you can See this? No, you can't. Great. This is going to be fantastic. I'm going to try to mirror this. Hey, Matt, this does not contribute towards my time, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm the only, only person standing between the audience and pizza, so that'll be fine. <laughs> pizza and drink. Pizza and beer. Great. Okay. Uh, Oh man, we're in 800 times 600. Can you mime it? Can I mime it? <laughs> of course. Oh man, yeah, I guess you don't see it a whole lot. So this, basically when you, when you fire up Neo4j, it's not easy to demo a database, right? But when you fire up Neo4j, you see a web user interface, which looks a lot better if you have a higher resolution than this. But this is the sort of um, uh, web UI for Neo4j, right? And you will use something like Cypher to say, Give me anything that matches parenthesis n, right? So any node, return that. And you're going to get a little pane describing a result set. Hopefully you can see this. In this case, it's completely empty. But let's say that we create a little demo here, a small data center graph, right? So if you look at this code, I, I used a new command before I said match, the keyword match. Now I use a new keyboard called create. And I'm gonna, just going to create a bunch of nodes with a resource label and, and a couple of names. Right? So I create them and also a few relationships on them. And now, all of a sudden, I can run queries like check the direct impact of server one being down. Right? So if I run this query, it's going to give you a little graph here where it says um, server one depends on, wait, we, the web server VM depends on server one. Right? So the, the graph that we created initially looks something like this, right? I don't know if you can see this at all, right? But here we have a little graph that we created. And I ran a query which told, told us what server one depends on, or probably the other way around, what, what depends on server one. Yeah, check the direct impact of server one being down. But if we want to do something a little bit more fancy, not just the direct impact, uh, okay, it was a great exercise to see. Okay, all right, uh, I guess I'm not doing that because I can't edit it here. Um, but we can look at a little bit more sophisticated query, like what is the most dependent upon component? Like if I have budget to replicate only one component in, in my data center, which one should that be, right? Which actually is a fairly sophisticated query, but you express that just in a few lines of this query language, and you run it and it's going to tell you the, the, the SAN. 
So that's an example of what it looks like working with uh, Neo4j. Um, really quickly then, um, so uh, in terms of performance, we were contacted a while ago by one of the biggest social networks on the planet, and they asked us, okay, this is a cute data model, but what if you know, we really cared about performance, right? What, what type of performance can you deliver? Show us some benchmark numbers. And us being the honest Swedish geeks that we are, we said, you know, we don't do benchmarks. And you heard like lies, damn lies, statistics, and then benchmarks, right? That's, that's the rule, right? So we said instead, give us a scenario and we'll show you how good we are at that scenario. And the scenario they gave us was that imagine you have a social network, 50, uh, you have a thousand people in it, 50 friends on average, you grab two people to see if they're connected. Um, what, how, how fast is that going to be? We ran that in MySQL and that was a 2,000 millisecond operation. 2,000 millisecond operation. In Neo4j, that was a 2 millisecond operation. So it's a thousand times faster. So we upped the ante a little bit. This was on my previous laptop. So I added a million people and 50 friends on average, so you know, 25 million total connections. Grab two people on random and check to see, and it's a two, still a two millisecond operation in, in Neo4j. So really happy about that. Um, <laughs> and that ends up being one of the key reasons why you would want to uh, use something like Neo4j. So final question before Matt really kicks me off stage. It's final slide, I pro promise. But a question for the audience. This is data-driven New York, so we have a lot of data people here. Can one of you uh, please name your, the absolute best, uh, the, 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 the best database in the universe? Can one of you name me the best database in the universe? Before Bob says SQL Server. <laughs> What's that? Not possible, depends on whatever. Political bullshit. Come on, give me the best <laughs> database in the universe. Come on. Okay, Bob, step up. Snowflake. <laughs> okay, Snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> Any other suggestions? Neo4j. Neo4j, that's a good suggestion. But actually, both of you are wrong. Because the best, the best database on the planet is actually this one, right? The human brain, right? And how's the human brain structured? Neurons to synapses to other neurons, right? Building up a big graph, a big network. So my one urging to you is to go home, download Neo4j, which is open source, start using it, look at your data, which I guarantee has a lot of connections in it, put that into Neo4j, reveal those connections, and start to see, play around with it. And I'm sure that it's going to reveal a lot of interesting insights. Thank you very much. All right, awesome. So, uh, time for literally a couple of questions for the good thing that you'll be here right after the questions by definition. This. Hey, so now that you're open source, what's the, what's the business model? I could have said, oh, over there. Uh, so, the question was, open source, what's the business model? Right, so there's uh, two editions of Neo4j. One is called Neo4j Community, which is a fully featured graph database. You can download it, you can play around with it, you can build your applications, you can put it in production, etc. But then there's a Neo4j Enterprise Edition, which includes a number of nice features if you do end up going into produ production and you're a big company that you would want to use. For example, clustering for high availability and failover, includes monitoring and management, knobs, and, and things like that. So, that's the business model. I'm one of the non-programmers, and I, what would I do with Neo4j community? Oh, and incidentally, I never heard of a graph database. I feel like I've just been to kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do with Neo4j community? If, if you're not a programmer, the learning curve is somewhat steep, but not impossible to climb. So uh, one of the interesting aspects about graph databases as a, as a data model. And I didn't see this ahead of time, but we hear a lot of our users come back in and tell us is that what you can do with a graph database is that you can actually show the data model to a non-techie and they will understand it. It's, gonna, it's, it's very visual. It looks like your domain. It has users connected to shopping carts, shopping carts connected to orders, orders connected to products, products connected in a product hierarchy, right? So it's a very, very visual way of seeing a domain that makes sense. So I think that would be my hope. Andrew, if you can run for the last one over there. And 
as you as you run, I want to give a special shout out to Dan over there, who's been literally standing in the back, periscoping away, holding a phone the entire time. Like I've, I think you're gonna be <laughs> sore tomorrow. <laughs> I want to seize on your last statement about graph being very visual, because that's what it is. I mean, that's, and that's, I think that's the real, um, it's the real strength of graph. The problem is getting there, as you said previously, it's like very hard to learn this language. So can you make this database and the tools and the functions totally GUI driven and forget about the language? Great question. Can we make it totally GUI driven? Honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we're certainly trying to improve as much as possible in this area. And the, in the new web UI we have is, has been fantastic for us from that pr perspective. Uh, but there's so many more things to do. Like the, the queries right now, basically what the query language does is that it builds up patterns in data, right? We just express them textually currently, but obviously you should be able to express them in a, in a point and click fashion, right? Say, Anne loves Dan, you should be able to just draw that, right? And then and throw that to the database. We're not there yet, but we're definitely working on it. All right, on that note, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. Thank you.